what I'm going to say to make it stick uh, better. Okay, uh, here we go. Um, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to try to make this quick because uh, I don't want to delay people from lunch. So I had mentioned the growing availability of big data within the health front and, and many other fronts. Big data is one of the catchwords of our, of our time. And while there's a lot of hype about it, there's a lot of truth there that the, the number and diversity and richness and velocity of data sources that we can now tap is growing rapidly. This is true in health. It's true in many other areas as well. Um, whether it comes down to aspects of, of being able to ask people questions in a lightweight way on phones, whether it's aspects of social media, their self-publishing behavior on tools like Twitter, uh, their searching behavior over time, whether it's point of sale records from their purchases uh, made of, of uh, for example, uh, food, uh, lab tests um, uh, that are performed, uh, uh, audio data gathered from phones or other wearable devices, uh, incoming outgoing calls and other types of communication uh, related records, uh, uh, browsing, and, and the types of data gathered on proximity and on physical activity and sedentary behavior and um, and on uh, location through consumer electronic devices and wearables. There's a, an explosion in, in types of data that, that are being available to, uh, to us. These, these types of data sources differ in many aspects. And we're going to be talking in this boot camp this afternoon and then throughout the boot camp about three major sorts that we're hitting as exemplars. Not because they're privileged, but because they are um, uh, relatively easy to obtain, uh, quite rich in addressing the four Vs, and uh, very readily combined with dynamic models. One of them is search-related behavior um, online. Uh, one is uh, self-publishing behavior, and we're taking a look at Twitter. And one is mobile data collection with smartphones and wearables. And we're going to have case studies and particular um, particular uh, coverage of each of these techniques. I noted the, the four V's before. Um, in terms of volume um, with big data, traditionally the number of records we have per participant far exceeds the number of participants we have. We may have a lot of participants, thousands, perhaps tens of thousands. Our smartphone-based system Ethica is being used in, in multiple studies with thousands of, of people in each study these days, but for example, the data records they offer up might record you know, thousands of data points per day from those individuals. And so over the course of a year, there's vastly larger amounts of data gathered about, about each individual than the number of individuals. Um, so you might have, in some cases, dozens of megabytes per participant per day. Um, Often this volume of data requires different handling, different techniques, data science techniques, because traditional te techniques bog down. Um, and uh, this is an example of, of uh, study, this, this one run by, uh, by Cheryl in terms of you know, millions of, of data items um, uh, collected from orientation to Wi-Fi to gravity sensors to uh, acceleration. Um, we have millions of data items uh, and, and survey responses, uh, many thousands. Velocity is, is perhaps a more defining feature vis-a-vis, -vis, or a more uh, uh, highly germane feature vis-a-vis -vis, uh, dynamic modeling, vis-a-vis -vis causal models. Um, electronic data sources, like causal models, are dynamic constructs very frequently. They collect data over time, and the data is time-stamped, like the output coming from a dynamic model. Um, and they are updated frequently compared to traditional data sources. Um, 
for example, multiple times a day, you might get Twitter, Twitter uh, outcomes per second. If you look at Twitter globally, it's like 10,000 tweets a second that come out on Twitter. But for a given individual or for the amount they're putting out or the feeds they're getting in, you might get many per day. Facebook updates, browsing behavior, screen and app use. Screen and app use may be hundreds of, of times per day in some cases. The, the phone is turned on and off or used. Um, EMAs, uh, weather-related data, point-of-sale related data. Um, and then, you know, things like accelerometers, gyroscopes, um, measurements from wearable devices concerning heart rate or concerning heart rate variability or EDA, electrodermal activity. Uh, it's, it's very, very frequent, uh, potentially per second uh, types of data. And this velocity provides high temporal resolution. I want to emphasize that. It provides high resolution for a given participant longitudinally over time and gives this picture into their microbehaviors and their exposures in the world that can be compared then with a dynamic model and inform a dynamic inform a causal understanding of what's going on at a level far exceeding what we could do with relying on course estimates from traditional tools, you know, filled out once a month or what have you. Um, another feature of this data that I've emphasized in the four Vs is variety. Uh, a given electronic data source often provides multiple lines of evidence, okay? Um, and uh, for example, with a smartphone, we might get location, physical activity, proximity to other participants, posture, aspects of humidity, EMA responses, uh, potentially things such as incoming and outgoing SMSs or calls or browsing behavior, etc. Um, or a smartwatch, you know, a, a bundle of different measurements for that participant over time. Um, and uh, often for a given participant, well, multiple lines, right? We know where they are and therefore the weather that obtained. We might know aspects of their point of sale behavior or the Facebook updates that they've seen or, or posted, aspects of their smartwatch or, or smartphone collected data. So with the appropriate consent that's, that's broad, we'll know aspects of these different spheres, electronic spheres, um, as well as uh, our electronic spheres here, as well as physical spheres that might affect their behavior. Um, and this evidence is cross-linked by behavior, uh, by, by participant and over time. So for a given participant, we'll have a picture over time with respect to multiple measurements. And often we can triangulate from multiple measurements the state of a participant using many lines of evidence. For example, Chen Yang here. Um, has done some wonderful work in automatic detection of smoking behavior, um, uh, triangulating from many aspects of their uh, situation, their accelerometry or gyroscope behavior, aspects of, of Wi-Fi signal strength, aspects of, of GPS that give a clue as to whether they're indoors or outdoors. Um, so one can boil down often multiple lines of evidence to judge their situation. Similarly, if we want to judge is someone in a vehicle or, or engaged in highly vigorous physical activity, are they running really, really fast or are they in a, a, a road in snarled traffic traveling very, very slowly um, by vehicular standards? We can often clue ourselves in through multiple lines of evidence for what's, what's going on. Um, and what this gives us is a rich set of longitudinal pictures. So if our interest is in waterborne illness, I did a lot of work for parts of my career and, and hope to do so again, involving uh, waterborne illness in Southern California, involving bathers and surfers. Um, uh, I know, I may not look like a surfer dude, but um, <laughs> I, have community, I have contacts in that community who most certainly are. Um, and. Uh, and here, you know, if we're interested in health outcomes like occurrence of highly credible gastrointestinal illness, we might be interested in when that individual went to bathe, uh, when, when they went surfing or, or using the ocean recreationally, and how that related to enterococcus levels as measured by municipal um, sampling, and how that related to beach closures and beach advisories so that we know which of their bathing occurred 
bless you, at, at certain uh, certain um, types of risk uh, levels and certain types of regulatory attempts to uh, to, to to dissuade use. And so it gives this sort of uh, picture biographically of what's going on. Or consider Lyme disease. We might have someone with an app that allows them to report if they find a tick on themselves, that allows them to report if they find a rash, or when they sought care. Maybe we get that through administrative data, alternatively. But maybe we also, with this app, record automatically where they are at any given time. Where they're circulating. Are they, are they indoors or outdoors? Are they in an area that's, uh, that's wilder, that has a lot of vegetation and, and uh, areas where a lot of ticks may, may be present and may, uh, may be able to uh, access them? So here we might look at their, their biography over time. Um, for example, when they removed a tick, when the rash appeared, when joint pain appeared or stiff neck, when they sought care. And we might layer on this, not shown here, additional aspects of their toing and froing and their behavior. We might look at activity level over geography. Where are people engaged in higher levels of physical activity or lower? Or social interactions during and after work, for example, um, that, that depict a, an individual's exposures um, within this area. And I would argue, for those from computational background, you may have heard of something called Metcalfe's Law was named after Bob Metcalf, who uh, is known as the inventor of this cable, this, the protocol that runs on this cable, Ethernet. Mm -hmm. um, and Metcalf coined a system science concept, um, a, a law um, that, that he observed called Metcalf's Law. And the argument was that if you have a network Say a network in its early days linking up business, people in a business to each other. Or, or maybe it's a social network like LinkedIn, um, which links up people. He argued the value of a network goes up super linearly. I think he argued specifically the square of the number of people in it. Because as each new person joins, they benefit from all the people that are there already in terms of connection. So their value is proportional to the number of people that are already present. And so if you total that up, first person, well, they're an early adopter, and they don't get a lot of value. I guess novelty, right? I was the first person on the internet. Um, <laughs> um, it's like, I, I don't know if you've ever traveled in Boston, but they have a plaque there celebrating the first subway stop in the Boston subway system. And I often wondered, Okay, so <laughs> what drew people to that subway stop? <laughs> Why would they have gone there, right? Maybe they went around in a circle? I don't know. Um, in any case, uh, the value of a network or a set of interconnections goes up proportionally. And I would argue the value of cross-linking data, of being able to draw data, different types of variety of data, goes up super linearly with the number of types of uh, data that we can measure. And it turns out that this is not only true combinatorially, we can do things like this, map out where they have social interactions from proximity and, and GPS, or map out where they, have, where they have physical activity from GPS and accelerometry. That, that's basic stuff. That's additive in, in a way. But we can also end up getting... Maybe it's more than additive, but we can also end up getting whispers of the underlying system that's much richer and clue us into an underlying understanding of the system. And finally, I'd mentioned veracity. Individual measurements can be more accurate than self-report, and collectively, they often uh, offer strong accuracy benefits. Um, so, for example, if we have, uh, if we want to know. Uh, is someone engaged in physical activity, um, you know, moderate to vigorous, vigorous physical activity, we'll often look at the gyroscope um, uh, and the accelerometer. The so gyroscope, it'll let us know, you know, is this even being carried by the person? Accelerometer will clue us in if it is being carried, how much physical activity are they getting? If this is just sitting on a counter, that's not a sign that I'm having low physical activity. In fact, I may be in the gym. Well, not right now, but 
you know, I, I could be in the gym for all it knows, right? It's not, a, it's not an indication of my behavior, uh, level of physical activity directly. And so often we can use multiple measurements to clue us in to the underlying situation. Okay, um, now it turns out that these collectively address a wide variety of needs within the health sciences that confront our models. Our models are often handicapped by uh, difficulty accessing information on location, where people spend the time. We actually frequently find a big difference between where people self-report their location is being and where their location actually is is measured through something like GPS or Wi-Fi uh, location. Um, their physical activity. Uh, we've known for decades there's a big gap between what people self-report for physical activity based on you know infrequent self-reporting retrospectively on the one hand versus what's actually measured using things like combined accelerometry and heart rate. Um, spatial proximity. Once again, we found it extremely burdensome and not accurate to ask people who they spent time with in the past day. People tend to forget or not be aware of a lot of contacts, uh, easily forgotten transient contacts uh, or brief periods of time, even 15 minutes where a colleague you know, was talking to someone else in, a, in the cubicle next to you or, or right nearby you but they weren't interacting with you, you forget it. Or, or it's, it's something which is just so burdensome you're not going to report it at all. <laughs> it's just incredibly burdensome. Um, the social context, um, who are they around and, and how are they speaking to them, et cetera. Um, their communicational behavior, you know, what are they exposed to messaging-wise from things like billboards, um, say in the States for tobacco products um, uh, or, or alcohol. Or, you know, here um, in Canada, it might include um, ads that are, that are um, or, or, you know, placement of products within convenience stores like e-cigarette promotion. Um, and mass media, what are you exposed to over the TV? What are you exposed to in terms of, um, in terms of radio, et cetera? Um, these things are hard to, to gather traditionally. Um, exposure to environments and behaviors to what degree are we exposed to an adverse built environment when it comes to physical activity? To what degree are we exposed to an adverse food environment? To what degree does not merely my home location um, indicate that, I'm, that I uh, live in a food desert, but to what degree does my activity space each day, how I get to work and back, or how I bring my kids to daycare and back, how does that relate to, to um, uh, food environments and, and availability of healthy grocery foods. Uh, so, you know, messaging environment is another one. So exposures are often of interest. They include social exposure, spatial related factors, etc. These things are hard to, hard to gather traditionally. And in dynamic models, often absent a good understanding of these behaviors and exposures, it handicaps our ability to, to rigorously quantitatively evaluate policy trade-offs. By informing this understanding using aspects of health big data, we can get, start to piece together an understanding of some of the factors that otherwise are speculative in our models. And we're going to see some of that uh, after lunch uh, in terms of the interaction of big data on the one hand with dynamic models. As we'll see, it interfaces in many ways. It provides avenues for, for uh, uh, databases, for model parameterization, model calibration. It provides mechanisms for updating the models, understanding over time using filtering techniques. It provides avenues for, for challenging a model, for theory building with respect to a model. It provides avenues additionally for better understanding models, um, uh, the, the uh, degree to which a model's characterization of the response to an intervention matches what we observe when that intervention is implemented in the world. So it helps us learn more quickly from interventions. 
So after lunch, we're going to talk about this encounter of big data with dynamic models. Those dynamic models we talked about earlier, agent-based models, system dynamics models, how do they come together with big data? But tomorrow and subsequent days, we're going to be talking about some of the most exciting components of that. Components related to use of machine learning methods together with dynamic modeling to make that coupling of big data and dynamic modeling, or traditional data and dynamic modeling, uh, particularly rich. And we're going to start to see little hints of that this afternoon with a case study by none other than our labs, Yuan Qian, um, will be presenting on, on uh, the use of Twitter data and classifying tweets to better understand uh, the the um, number of influenza cases uh, observed over time um, in informing that from an understanding from Twitter feeds. Uh, very good. So I think I'll stop there right now. We'll continue after lunch. Um, I'm going to ask the TAs to help guide the participants up to the, um, to the comfortable confines of Marcus Hall. And if you can make sure that they, um, they have their their meal cards, uh, like this one here, um, for the correct day, you should be able to present these at the entrances, at the entrance, okay? And I'll be joining you for lunch, uh, and we'll see you there in, in just a few minutes after I upload these videos, okay? The, the room will be locked, and uh, you're welcome to leave your, your personal debts here if you'd like to do so.